Time has come once again, everyone. Need to stab somebody to death on their turn? Are you tired of your party using low strength characters? Do you need to just drain them of all their resources and then stab them to death? Or is your GM really fond of using just one guy? In any case, today on Min Maxing for Fun and Profit in Legacy Pathfinder, at the request of Miss Ellie Nielsen, we've got the build for you. Let's optimize us a swashbuckler. If you guys are liking what you're seeing, remember it's the like and subscribe button. Today, this episode of Min Maxing for Fun and Profit was brought to you in part by Joseph Citadino. Thanks for your time and support, my friend. Thanks for helping me build some zombies for three dragons. You're the best. Now, off we go. Okay, so for those of us who might not have played Legacy Pathfinder, or for those of us who might have missed the Swashbuckler, imagine, if you will, a lightly armored character who has a lot of actions that don't take place on their turn. Someone who probably is using dexterity to damage, though I have built a strength Swashbuckler, and truthfully, that was almost this video. Regardless, the class is really fun to play. It's also a class that you definitely want to cheat sheet when you're playing, especially at higher levels, because you'll have so much you can do in combat, it's nice to have it right in front of you. With that said, a lot of what the swashbuckler does trips over the swashbuckler and gums it up because several of the very powerful swashbuckler deeds, like rage powers, like rogue talents, etc., just the swashbuckler version, require the use of the immediate action. Now, a lot of my builds will dip one level of Swashbuckler for opportune parry and repost. Yes, using OPR, as we'll call it for the rest of this video, is an immediate action, which means you don't get your next turn swift action, and you only ever have the one immediate action in a given turn. Is that still good? Yeah, it is. It's reactive. It prevents the bad guy from doing damage to you, possibly, and gives you a chance to hit them. There's nothing more powerful than that, except for, I guess, like, hold person and wizards and krakens that are choking you out. Did you miss that one? Follow this card, right up here. We'll teach you how to play a scary, scary druid. But today's video is all about taking the swashbuckler as the base, the chassis, if you will, building around it, shoring up its weakness with multi-classing, while still maintaining the fluidity, while still maintaining the action economy on your turn. Honestly, this video had a lot of different builds before I made it. I'm very satisfied with this one, though. Now, straight down to it, dexterity and charisma are the two most important things for this build. Honestly, to optimize most of the time, dexterity and charisma are what you want. Intelligence will also play a role here. Here. Of course, do not ignore your con or your whiz because you don't want to die as you will be in melee, or get mind controlled as your full bab and help the wizard get stabbed by your rapier. Strength, however, dump it as low as you're comfortable with. You won't be wearing armor. Really, you kind of just need to carry your bracers of armor, your rapier, your cloak, your belt, your headband, your ring. As long as you're not encumbered with that, you should be fine. Now, as for our race, really straight out, there's no other way to do it we must play a human. In addition to the human swashbuckler's favored class bonus, increasing the total number of points in the pool by four, being playable. Also, we really need that bonus feat at first to make this build pan out, because our feet taxes are pretty feet taxy. Also, a feat we'll be taking later on in our career requires us to be human, and that means we don't have to take the adopted trait to, you know, cheat that in. So, human it is. Now, straight down to it. There's five classes going into this build. Honestly, I think that's the most I've ever used. Two of them are prestige classes. Yeah, I guess I've been playing too much 3.5. The dips, as we'll call them, though I don't know if we necessarily can call them dips as much as pivots, seeing as they're shoring up the weakness of, oh, we used our immediate action, now we're shields down, will help us still accomplish the main goal of the optimized party, this time being the switch hitter. Don't know what I mean? Here's an old video. Follow this card. The swashbuckler can definitely take damage, redirect damage, kill things very dead, but it's not quite the powerhouse that like our kraken that we built or the come and get me barbarian with a gigantic threat range is. It's not quite the hold person misfortune supremacy that witches and wizards are, but we certainly have some debuff power. 
and we're probably going to be one of the fastest members of the party, so that's our goal. Keep ads off the Punisher, go harass spellcasters, be where we need to be. Honestly, if you don't subscribe to my build style, another better way to do this might be to say that the swashbuckler we're about to present is a very good fifth party member, assuming you've got a big tanky boy, divine caster, arcane caster, skill monkey. You kind of shore up all of them. Get here. Our first level is a swashbuckler level, but it's not just vanilla. Like I said, no, we're better than that. I'm sure you swashbucklers out there already guessed this one, but it's the Inspired Blade archetype that we'll be taking. We're taking the Inspired Blade because we won't have as many swashbuckler levels as other things, and we want to shore up our panache, or key pool for swashbucklers, basically. The Inspired Blade gets a number of panache points equal to charisma plus intelligence, instead of just their charisma, but only regains them by critting with a rapier, which will eventually have a 15 to 20 threat range, so easy peasy lemon squeezy, not even worried about it. Also, in addition to getting weapon finesse out the gate for free, with the rape here. Also, the Inspired Blade gets handed weapon focus. Now, in addition to that, we'll also grab all of the level 1 swashbuckler deeds here. Daring Do lets us get exploding dice on acrobatics, climb, escape artist, fly, ride, or swim, which means you roll a d6, spending a panache point and adding the result to the check. But if you roll the 6, you roll again, and if you roll the 6, go again a number of times equal to your dex mod. So you can be very jumpy, very escapey, very flyy. Honestly, I played an open legend game once and exploding dice get real dumb real quick. Anywho, dodging panache says that when an opponent attempts a melee attack against you, you can as an immediate action spend a panache point to move five feet and grab a dodge bonus, remember that stacks with other dodge bonuses, equal to your charisma modifier against that attack. The movement doesn't negate it, it's still resolved. It's not a five foot step, so it would provoke from other creatures, and you can only do it while wearing light or no armor. But this deed's really good if for some reason the bad guy can't take a five foot step because it shuts off full attacks. It might also get you out of harm's way as an immediate action. Step back, get a buff, it wasted the attack, it being like a bear that doesn't know chase you but knows instead start clawing at the guys standing next to you still in its threat range. Now, the big one, the hallmark of the swashbuckler is the deed opportune parry and repost, again, the OPR. When somebody makes a melee attack against you, spend one panache point and expend a use of an attack of opportunity to attempt to parry the attack. The swashbuckler makes an attack roll as if you're making an AOO. For each size category the attacking creature is larger than you, the swashbuckler takes a minus two on the roll. Man, we were almost an ogre, not gonna lie. Be as big as we can to parry the bigger things, but it'd be fine. If your attack roll is greater than the attacking creature's attack roll, the creature's attack will automatically miss, and then, if you've got at least one panache point left as an immediate action, see what I mean, we only have so many of these, you can make an attack against that creature as long as it's within your reach. So the idea is you have combat reflexes, you have a crazy high dex, Honestly, the Kensai Magus can do this just as well, because the Kensai can add its int to its AOOs. Whoa, that build's gnarly. Anyway. You get attacked, you parry it, then if you have that immediate action, you can stab once. You still have several rounds of shields in case you get full attacked, and if you do get full attacked, you're making an attack of opportunity. Your dice roll is not going down, the bad guys is for multiple attacks and things, though granted, you can only stab them the once, nevertheless, make that one stab count, pretty good. Honestly, we almost, almost worshipped Torog, so we get attack of opportunity, with a Warhammer. Doing so would let us add Vital Strike for, you know, more damage and things. Anyway, that's our last Inspired Blade level for a little while. Our second level will be a level of Scaled Fist Monk, of course, because Charisma to Armor class is really powerful. We're already a dex-based character, so we're not wearing heavy armor. If we can add our Charisma to our armor class in addition to our Dexterity, while also getting Bracers of Armor, Amulet of Natural Armor, Ring of Protection, Dodge and Mobility, which are prerequisites for where we're going, as well as Dodging Panache, really, really hard to hit us. Also, the bonus feat is pretty nice, and once again, we'll be going the route of the Unchained Monk for Synergy. Tell you about that in a minute. Suffice to say, the Flurry of Blows just comes out a little better for this build. Also, a D10 and full bab is real nice. Anywho, our next two levels, can you guess? Okay, I'll take it that you didn't, but you probably did, because you're smart, right? Paladin 1 and 2. 
the level two swashbuckler, and we'll go back, gets an ability called Charmed Life, which says that three times per day is an immediate action before attempting a save. Add your charisma modifier to the result of the save. Eventually this goes up multiple times per day, but it's again an immediate action. We want to use our immediate action for the repost in OPR. So two levels of Paladin grabs us Divine Grace, adding our charisma to all three of our saves as a constant. It's just better, truly. We're already very charisma focused, there is no reason to not do this for the sake of optimization. Does it trap you into the trappings of LG? Maybe. I don't know your meta. Some GMs will be willing to work with you, some will not. In any case, it helps us stay away from being mind controlled, stay away from being poisoned, stay away from failing saves, which is important. We will go back to Swashbuckler for 5, 6, and 7. Those will be our last Swashbuckler levels. In total, we will have 4. Grabbing Rapier training at 5th would have been really nice, but we have different tools in the toolbox, you guys will see. In place of that, like I said, we're getting Charmed Life. Also, Nimble, a plus 1 dodge bonus to AC while wearing light or no armor. So, you know, more dodge on top of our dodge for extra dodge, stay the hell in dodge, actually. And one bonus feat. That bonus feat happens to land at character level 7 and makes for some really, really good synergy. Honestly, something I didn't know existed until I made this video and I'm very stoked to try it out myself. In addition, of course, this will grab us several more deeds. If you've got one panache point, you're up from prone as a move action without provoking a swift action if you want to spend a panache point. Not bad. Maybe there's an earthquake. Maybe you fight too many wolves. Menacing Swordplay says that while you've got at least one panache point, when you hit an opponent with a light or one-handed piercing melee weapon, you can then demoralize as a swift action with intimidate instead of a standard action. I have a character that I want to be playing sometime in the near future. Right now it is not in the cards. It's built around menacing swordplay. Again, I'm not planning on us having our swift action. And if we do, we probably used it to smite evil anyway. Because again, paladin, high charisma, no reason to not. Swashbuckler's initiative gives us a plus two on our initiative checks. If we have quick draw, we unfortunately do not, but oh well. Our hands are free and unrestrained, and we have any single light or one-handed piercing melee weapon that's not hidden. It can be drawn as part of initiative, but really I think most of your initiative is rolled after weapons are drawn and dungeons are being delved. Anyway, the big one is Precise Strike. This stacks real wonderfully with something else we'll be getting, along with another thing that stacks with OPR, kind of weirdly. Yeah, anywho, Precise Strike says at level 3, while we've got one panache point, a swashbuckler gains the ability to strike precisely. God, really? Thanks. With a lighter one-handed piercing melee weapon, though not natural weapon attacks, fortunately our arm is not a rapier. Adding our swashbuckler level to the damage dealt. We can't attack with a weapon in our offhand, we can't use a shield other than a buckler or our charisma modifier might as well be a shield. If a creature is immune to sneak attack, it's immune to the additional damage, and we can even draw a throwing knife if we wanted to, but probably don't. This damage is precision damage, so we won't multiply it on a crit, but if we have that swift action, pop a panache point and we'll double the bonus damage on the next attack, as long as we make that attack before the end of our turn. Can't set up for OPR. So that's four, or swift action, eight. Not bad if you're trying to Nova out and you've smote a dude. Honestly, I really want to play a swashbuckler again now that I do this video. Anyway, levels 8, 9, and 10 are going to be our first prestige class. The prestige class could be dropped if you really wanted to. If you'd like to take three more swashbuckler levels, don't take this prestige class. But it has a lot of synergy with a lot of the things we will be doing, especially at high level play. Therefore, this build takes not one, not two, but three levels of the prestige class Shadow Dancer. This is, to be perfectly honest with you, one of the most broken prestige classes in all of 3.5 and Pathfinder, seriously. Hide in plain sight is just dumb. You can get your stealth score up really high in Pathfinder. God, that's a video unto itself. You just need to be within areas of dim light or darkness, like most adventures, or carry a gloom stick around, like a sunrod, but the opposite. And things can't find you. Combo that with spring attack, since stealth is part of a move action, run up, stab a dude, keep moving, re-stealth, seriously, like, 
they will never find you. Especially in adventure paths. I know I go on about this a lot, but Kane, the guy who edits my videos and hangs out at the IOPC, he played a Tengu, Unchained Rogue, into Shadow Dancer. Nothing in Fort Rannick had means of detecting Magpie. Perhaps the caster at the end might start chucking fireballs, but that's not that precise, and then evasion happens. One of these days, I'll play a very Assassin's creed -y game where the whole party is Shadow Dancers, and it's going to be amazing, but that's not really the reason we want to take those three levels. We want to do it because a Shadow Dancer eventually gets a Shadow Companion. In addition to Uncanny Dodge, which means they're never touching our Flat-Footed, which will be our worst armor class, Evasion, which helps us take no damage on successful Fireball Dodging, and Dark Vision, and a Rogue Talent, and the ability to make Illusion spells. Now, mostly we want this Shadow. It matches our alignment, so... Hooray for Lawful Good Undead, don't tell for asthma. It has a plus four on will saves, having damage versus positive channeled energy, so channel resistance plus four, and it can't be turned or commanded. It has a number of hit points equal to half of our total, and it uses our bab as its bab. If it dies, there's a fort save or bad things happen to us, but we're a paladin, we got this. A shadow's probably the strongest low tier monster in this game. When a shadow touches, oh, by the way, it's targeting the touch AC, probably the lowest AC of everybody that you're fighting. It does a d6 of strength damage, as long as that creature is alive. It's a negative energy effect, so that might actually buff the Zambos. Be careful with that one. A creature dies if this strength damage exceeds its strength score. Unfortunately, we can't then turn it into a spawn, but the shadow helps maximize our action economy and what we're doing. We want to make an attack roll when we are attacked. We want our attack roll to be greater than the attack roll of what attacks us. So if there's something that can attack through the floor, attack through ceilings, something that's taking half damage from magical attacks, no damage from non-magical attacks, as it is incorporeal, Suddenly, the whole squad that you're fighting has ghost touch weapons. Over time, the attacks targeting you will be weaker and weaker. Now, are we trying to optimize around the shadow's ability to strength someone out? Kind of, but mostly no. Now, granted, if the controllers in the back want to switch to anything that does strength damage, sure. We'll tap them out really fast, but the idea here is just to wear them down so over time, not only is it basically guaranteed that we're going to be able to parry and then stab in, it makes the attacks that do connect with us, like big giant criticals, or connect with other members of the party that much smaller. It also helps offset that minus two, because eventually we are going to be fighting bigger than medium creatures, and in large person will hurt our dexterity. So we just buy it off right there. With the shadow, it's incredibly powerful. Now, moving forward, our last ten levels will be another prestige class, a prestige class that helps shore up the Swashbuckler's weaknesses even more. It's basically the Swashbuckler 2.0. A lot of people that I know that play Swashbucklers will play Inspired Blade 10, Duelist 10. And for that reason, our build will take its final 10 levels as Duelist levels. Remember how we said intelligence was important? Not just for the Inspired Blade, canny defense, much like a Kensai, says that when wearing light or no armor and not using a shield, raise your hand if that's you. It is if you're playing this build. A duelist adds one point of intelligence, if any, per duelist class level as a dodge bonus to AC while wielding a melee weapon. And, you know, technically with that one monk level, every time we're not dead, we're wielding a melee weapon because, you know, our body is a weapon. And you know what else we get as a duelist? Precise strike. Yeah, when making a precise strike, a duelist cannot attack with a weapon in their other hand or use any shield. It only works against living creatures with discernible anatomies. So things that are immune to crits are immune to this. And something like the fortification enchantment might shut it off. But we're also adding our duelist level. Also, we're buffing our initiative all the way up to plus four. Also, we have mobility, we need it as a prereq for both of our prestige classes, which is why Duelist Shadow Dancer makes a lot of sense to me, because basically is the same class in terms of prereqs. We get an additional plus four to our armor class against attacks of opportunity caused by moving, stacking with mobility, stacking with, you know, all the things forever, and combat reflexes at level 14. Though we took it a lot faster than we did now, we can retrain that feat as we've taken it twice. We get a competence bonus on our reflex saves. We can charge in difficult terrain. If we fight defensively, it's an additional plus one dodge to AC for every three levels. So max of plus three more. 
withdraw actions will always provoke from us, but really it's two really, really familiar abilities. At second level, the duelist gets an ability called parry. Whenever the duelist takes a full attack action with a lighter one-handed piercing weapon, oh a rapier, we elect not to take one of our attacks. At any time before our next turn, we can attempt to parry an attack against us or an adjacent ally as an immediate action. We take a bigger penalty on this one, a minus four for every size bigger, again the shadow will help with that, and once we ding fifth or 15th, we can make an attack of opportunity against any creature whose attack we successfully parry so long as the creature is within reach. Now that's where the synergy gets a little weird, not gonna lie. I have to defend this one. This is not a rules is written. This is a, frankly, abuse of the way something is written. It says whose attack she successfully parries. Not parries using the parry ability, parries. I make this build under the assumption that we can use Riposte from the Duelist in conjunction with Opportune Parry and Riposte essentially burning through our AOOs at double the rate to be able to parry all the things. Now, I know, cheesy. I can hear it all across the internet land and I don't disagree with that notion, but we are parrying. There's not a link to parry, there's no the parry ability from Swashbuckler or parry ability from Duelist written in to repost, so I think it should be able to work and consider this. By the time we have access to this, we're level 15. The Duelist has a base attack bonus of 6 requirement, meaning we'd have to be at least 11th level to make this synergy work. By 11th level, the wizard is teleporting us places, the cleric is bringing back the dead, the Barbarian is hitting for way harder than we ever dreamed. The Magus is outshining us in every other way. Animal companions have all the feats they need. Same with that druid to two-turn kill somebody. So I don't think it's a game-breaking stretch to allow that synergy to work. It also costs us double our attacks of opportunity. Even if we end up with something like a dexterity modifier of 13, that means we have basically parry and repost seven attacks in a round. Assuming we have access to all the books, all the belts, everything we can possibly get our hands on to buff our dexterity. That number will probably be a lot smaller in a lot of games, especially if you don't have an item crafter, especially if you don't have access to a lot of money. I think it's perfectly reasonable. If your GM doesn't let this fly, the duelist levels are still good, they still buff everything that we're doing, more so in my opinion than the swashbuckler would by leveling it higher because our capstone, check this out, crippling critical. When we confirm a critical hit using a lighter one-handed piercing weapon, again, we're stuck on the rape here, you can either reduce all of the target's speed by 10 feet to a minimum of 5 feet, do a d4 points of strength or dex, a minus 4 on all saves, a minus 4 to armor class, or 2d6 points of bleed. These penalties last for 10 rounds, except for ability damage, which must be healed normally, except for bleed damage, which cure light wounds or a dc15 heal check to stop it. Now, this is where the final bit of synergy kicks in. You guys see where I'm going with this? Our shadow is doing a d6 every round. When we crit, we can do an extra four. Probability says that lands us anywhere between five and seven points of strength damage when these crits happen, and we're critting 25% of the time with a keen rapier, which brings down the modifier of somebody's strength score, give or take, by three to four every round of combat. Now, most high-level bad guys will be immune to ability damage, so versus Cthulhu, we're smiting and stabbing, and that honestly works just as well because it might die faster, but say like a dragon, say somebody with class levels, a more physical opponent, it's an incredibly powerful debuff to say nothing of, oop, minus four on your saves, hey witch, give this one disadvantage and then knock it to sleep so we can coup de gras it to death. It's just bonkers. Now, feats. Our feat chain looks a little weird since we're jumping around so much, and it will involve feats on our shadow as well. Show you how in a sec. Yeti Weapon Focus Rapier, Weapon Finesse, and Dodge will be our feats at first level. That's why our first level is a swashbuckler level. It helps us get online faster. Dodge, of course, is a plus one dodge bonus to AC. Mostly it's prereqs. We're just getting them out of the way now. Weapon Finesse says we're using our dexterity instead of our strength for attack rolls with weapons that qualify, like rapiers. And now we've got a plus one to attack with rapiers as well. 
All right, you guys ready for the most feet taxiest of feet tax ever? Yeah. We need to be a human for one more feat at this level. Two bonus feats from the Inspired Blade, one from level one, and for human we get one more. We'll be taking Weapon Focus, choosing the Butterfly Sword. This is a weapon we will never pick up. Literally, this build functions 110% around the rapier, but without this feat, without being a human, it falls on its face, pay the tax, smile when the tax man comes, think about your property taxes as I'm recording this in December that will soon be due, and I promise, at least in this case, it's gonna pay off, you'll see. Our scaled fist level, of course, grabs us another bonus feat right out the gate at second and it's combat reflexes. This can be retrained into something else. Retrain this into dodge and retrain dodge into improved initiative if you must, but we need it for now. We'll get it later, but right now, this is just where it sits. Level 3, we'll take Mobility at our first Paladin level, which gives us a plus 4 dodge bonus to AC against attacks of opportunity caused when you move out or within a threatened area. Mobility is a prereq both for the Shadow Dancer and for the Duelist. Our fifth level feat will be Piranha Strike. Our base attack ends up at 19. We lose one from going into Shadow Dancer, but it's the same idea as Power Attack just the weapon finesse version, because we don't have a strength of 13 probably. If you did, take power attack. Honestly, we were almost not an inspired blade. Almost we were a swashbuckler shenaniganzing like a katana or a bastard sword, something that could be two-handed on our turn for a bigger power attack damage buff having 13 strength, then free action going to one hand so we could do even more, but Precise Strike makes it better. Anyway, take a minus one penalty on your melee attacks and CMBs to get a plus two bonus on damage rolls when your bad breach is four, and for every four thereafter, it's a minus one for a plus two again, and it doesn't stack with power attack. So eventually, it's take away five, add 10. Though, of course, choosing this means it's on for the round, so it will affect our parries as well. Nevertheless, when you gotta squeeze that damage in, you gotta squeeze that damage in, it's a staple feat. Now, at level seven, our fourth swashbuckler level, we get a feat and a bonus feat, this is where some of the dumb stuff comes in. Again, I didn't know about this synergy before I made this video. It's really cool. I would definitely remake one of my characters. It kind of honestly sets my Zen Archery competition video on its head. Follow this card right here, by the way. That's a real good one. Anyway, at feat level 7, we're grabbing martial versatility in conjunction with another feat. Choose one combat feat we know that applies to a specific weapon, like Weapon Focus. It now applies with any weapon within that same group. Now, remember, our bonus feats from being a swashbuckler treat our swashbuckler levels as our fighter levels. Again, it's the only way we could get it, and it's one of the reasons we run swashbuckler all the way up to four. The combat feat in question is the combat feat we're taking right alongside this aesthetic style. We need weapon focus with the chosen melee weapon. Oh, we got it. A bab of one or monk level one have them both. We choose one weapon from the monk fighter weapon group. When using this style and wielding the chosen weapon, you can apply the effects of feats that have improved unarmed strike as a prereq as well as effects that augment an unarmed strike as if the weapon was an unarmed attack. Okay, so this is a little hairy, but Aesthetic style requires us to have weapon focus with the chosen melee weapon, though the benefit calls out one weapon from the monk fighter weapon group. This seems to kind of fall into the specific versus general thing. Just because we are proficient with monk weapons, that doesn't mean we can use aesthetic style with, say, like a Kusari Gama or a bow staff or anything like that because we only have weapon focus with the rapier and the butterfly sword. Therefore, to me, seems to check out. The chosen feat for martial versatility is aesthetic style. We have to choose the butterfly sword because the prerequisite to take this feat in the first place is weapon focus butterfly sword. This allows us to use aesthetic style with all weapons in the monk or light blade group, as those are the groups that the butterfly sword is in, and you know what's a light blade? Yeah, a rapier. But it gets better. Aesthetic form is the next feat which says that you can use the chosen melee weapon, the rapier. Now, technically some might say, you need to take martial versatility a whole bunch. I don't think so, because you're already in aesthetic style. Aesthetic style says it's good. Everything else seems to augment aesthetic style to me. So 
We can now use the chosen melee weapon with any class ability that can be used with an unarmed strike, such as an Unchained Monk's Style Strike. You know what else is a class ability that can be used with an unarmed strike? Flurry of Blows. Yeah, one extra attack at our highest bab, stacking with all the things because we're an Unchained Monk. Now it's on the rapier. It's a weird feet dip and it feels real taxi, but this does in theory allow you to flurry with any weapon in the game. Blech. Excuse me, I threw up a little, because that's disgusting is why. The final one, the next feat we take is Aesthetic Strike. This says that you can use the unarmed strike damage of a monk four levels lower than your character level. Minimum of first instead of the base damage for that 1d6 rapier. Yeah, you with me? That's that thing, and we're doing it. At feet level 13, it's Spring Attack, which says as a full round action, you can move up to your speed and make a single melee attack without provoking, moving both before and after the attack as long as you move 10 feet before the attack in the total distance. You can't use this ability to attack at a foe that is adjacent to you at the start of your turn, so it takes a little bit of work in, but again, it's too good for the Shadow Dancer to not take. And even if we weren't trying to hide from things, we get a bigger AC when we're moving, no reason to not. Our next feat will be extra panache for two extra panache points at the start of each day and an increase of our total panache pool by two. Why? Because some people may need to take improved critical or fencing grace on their build. Now, of course, in theory, we would prefer the keen enchantment which will double the threat range of our rapier from 18 to 20 to 15 to 20, and the agile enchantment, which will let us add dexterity to damage with our rapier with no hoops to jump through like fencing grace, especially because we are definitely flurrying. I wanted to leave one feet intentionally a little open. Is it bad to have more panache? No, I think it's a good option. Because if we aren't adding our dex to damage, it's not gonna be that good. Our last two feats are outflank and paired opportunists. Teamwork feats at the end, you say? What? You continue to say? Yeah, just, just hear me out. The shadow is kind of the secret tech of this build for how strong it is. It can't have feats. It can't have ranks in bluff. Otherwise, it would take Broken Ruin Gambit. But what it can have is a pair of Kaistas with the training enchantment to grab both of the teamwork feats in question to add value both to the shadow itself and the Palamonk Swash Shadow Duelist Dancer Buckler. That's a lot of classes in one. Seriously, this is the most classes I've ever put on a build. I really like it though. Yetihu, let's talk about these feats, shall we? Outflank says, whenever you and an ally who also has this feat are flanking the same creature, the flanking bonus goes up to four, and whenever you score a crit against the flank creature, it provokes from your ally. Whenever you're adjacent to an ally who also has this feat, you receive a plus four circumstance bonus on attacks of opportunity against creatures that you both threaten. Enemies that provoke attacks of opportunity from your ally also provoke from you so long as you threaten them, even if the situation or ability would normally deny you the AOO. This doesn't allow you to take more than one AOO against a creature for a given action. A training weapon gives one combat feat to the wielder as long as the weapon is drawn and in hand or you're wearing it because they're kaisis, they're bracers, with like punchy bits on the end. The feat is chosen when it's made and can't be used as a prereq for other feats. Now, okay, I hear you now, the shadow can't pick that up. The shadow's incorporeal, ghost touch weapon. A ghost touch weapon deals damage normally against the incorporeal and can also be picked up and moved by said incorporeal creature at any time, which means our shadow can equip it. You know what? Let's put the training enchantment on it one more time for combat reflexes. But with our shadow having a plus two dex mod, and you know you could feed it a manual of quickness of action to buff that up even more, but imagine this. You're a swashbuckler. You've parried the attack successfully that's been coming at you. The shadow is adjacent to you. You expend an attack of opportunity because you get that attack of opportunity to repost. That enemy has just provoked an attack of opportunity from you. They are now unable to defend themselves due to a flick of your wrist and you stab in. So does the shadow. The shadow targets touch, does strength damage. You crit, do strength damage. This gets even better if you're flanking because when you crit and you will 25% of the time, it provokes from the shadow, meaning the shadow will get extra attacks, meaning the strength score of the bad guy will be drained out. See where I'm going with this? It's super mean and we're not even tracking like poison or anyone else in the party's ability to nuke strength. For our one rogue talent, take fast stealth, move at full speed while hiding in plain sight. 
with your shadow following under the floor right behind you, and suddenly you're the party scout. Synergy so real. Now, some quick stats, shall we? Let's say we started with 20 dexterity, we probably should, 18 plus 2, invest all the way, 5 levels worth of dexterity, 6 from a belt, 5 more from a tome, and that's 36 dexterity. A modifier, of course, of 13. Take that 13, plus our bab of 19, a plus 5 weapon enhancement. Now, the answering enchantment is definitely good for us, but eventually we'd replace it for a plus 5. One more from weapon focus. And you know, let's start with 17 charisma. I don't like odd numbers, what can I say? Six from our headband, five from our tome of leadership and influence means we've got a 28 charisma. Or a mod of nine, let's say we smote some evil, we're at nine, and we're gonna take away five. That means with everything going, 42 twice, Flurry of Blows is real with a rapier now, 37, 32, 27. And remember, that number is four higher if we're parrying, thanks to paired opportunists. Now, as far as our damage goes, since we're a 16th level monk on the end of that rapier, that's 2d8 points of damage on the rapier, that's amazing. Plus 5 from the enhancement, plus 10 from full bore piranha strike, plus 4 from inspired blade precise strike. Remember, that's precision damage, it is not multiplied. 10 more from the duelist ability of the same name, 13 from our dex, and 2 from smite evil means that we're doing 2d8 plus 45 points of damage, averaging out at 54. All of that doubles except for the Inspired Blade Precise Strike on a critical, so that's on average 102 damage on a critical hit, plus a d4 of strength or other things that we might want to do. Also, it provoked from the Shadow, who's draining strength more, and you guys see how this works. Again, it's a really fantastic fifth party member. It's a wonderful switch hitter, stand next to the Punisher, do some parrying, get the damage in, and win the long game. Draining out the strength of the bad guy, if they're not strength based, honestly, this build can result in very fast kills. 7 strength wizard? Yeah, no, get wrecked. Shadows are scary and powerful for a reason, and you just fuel it as it fuels you. The same is definitely true in the mirror versus other swashbucklers or rogues or shadow dancers or monks that are dex based. You just tag them and they tag out really fast. Against the strength based guys, you might not necessarily take them to zero, but you will debuff them into the ground. The power of that cannot be understated. Now, before we sign off today, in addition to, of course, remember your ring of protection, amulet of natural armor, Cloak of Resistance, Belt of Physical Might, Constitution and Dexterity, Headband of Mental Prowess for Charisma and Wisdom, and of course enchanting that rapier, and your Braces of Armor, because we want to cheat on an armor bonus while not wearing armor. There is one really good magic item for this build. It is known as the Corset of Delicate Moves. From the Melee Tactics Toolbox, it says that once per day is a move action, the wearer can take an additional swift action. The swift action can't be used to cast a spell or spell-like ability. Hooray, smite evil is a supernatural. You guys see the point here. We used our immediate action, we lost our next turn swift action, corset of delicate moves, boom, taken care of. Smite and stab, they'll die as they lived in the flash of the blade. You guys will never know how badly I wanted to pitch shift some midi for some Iron Maiden for this one. Maybe next time, we'll see. Anyway, that's all we got for today, guys. Hope you enjoyed all this craziness. What do you guys think? Have we played Swashbucklers before? Do you think you could optimize the damage a little better? Hey, we've got one more Legacy Pathfinder patron request coming down. It's gonna feel a lot like our Druid. But instead of grappling with Kraken style and stuff, we will be optimizing Snapping Turtle style. See you next Saturday.